Hi everyone, it's another video with Doug Rosendahl. Doug, thanks for making time this morning here. Glad to be here. We're going to talk today about how pilots understanding, perception, knowledge of, of airplanes, machinery in general has changed, uh, not just of airplanes, but of, of, of things in general. We just, we just live in a different world today than we did a generation or two ago. And as far as airplanes are concerned, Doug, you have a, a catchy phrase for that. What do you call that? Well, Martin, we're still flying the same airplanes that we were, you know, 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've observed in aviation is we have gone from a, a situation where we teach pilots how the airplane works to a world where we teach pilots how to work the airplane. Mm -hmm. And that's a fundamental difference. Right. And uh, I've seen a lot of that, and it's, it's uh, as you said, it's not just in aviation, it's cultural. You know, I, I think probably when you and I uh, both grew up uh, in h high school or in junior high in auto shop, we overhauled a lawnmower, okay? And people learn more about, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, changing the points or the plugs or the head gasket on my pickup truck on Sunday afternoon. And today that never happens. And... Uh, when airplanes like this were being flown, they're very simple. And it is possible to have essentially mastery level knowledge of how this airplane works. Compared to a modern day automated airplane where I would argue no one, no single person, understands entirely how a modern uh, fly-by-wire airplane works. The complexity is it, just so enormous exactly. that no, no single human can do it. And the example that I use is in 1984, I b bought my first PC, and it came preloaded with a software program called CalcStar, a spreadsheet program, mm -hmm. an early spreadsheet program. This is before Lotus 1, 2, 3. Does that bring <laughs> back memories? Mm -hmm. And it was a very simple spreadsheet program, and I had mastery level understanding of that spreadsheet. Every function that it had, I could utilize. And I would argue today, again, like the automated airplane, there's no single human being that can exploit all the capabilities of Microsoft Excel. Right. It is so deep and so broad and so, uh, so many functionalities that it's, you, we, we learn to use what we need to get the job done. And it would cost, you know, an astronomical amount of money to teach pilots. You know, it, 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 frankly, it's impossible. But it, to try to teach pilots all of the functionality. And in a modern airliner like that, you know, when the light comes on, the pilot goes to the QRH, Quick Reference Handbook, opens it up to the page that shows that light, and there's a checklist, and you execute that checklist, and you hope that solves the problem. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't solve that problem, it's going to be a bad day. But, you know, hopefully they've envisioned every situation that can occur in the airplane, and we can resolve it. As we more and more automate our legacy airplanes, like my Baron, for instance, and put more and more automation in them, and we have more and more ECAS warning, you know, messages and stuff, but we don't have the quick reference handbook to accompany that. Okay, so we're relying on the pilot to understand what that light really means at a higher level. And I don't think, based on the things that I see in social media aviation sites and things like that, I don't think people are embracing that like we should. Um, as pilots, we have a responsibility to be in a continuous quest for knowledge and quality improvement. And just because you didn't learn it in your private, your commercial, or your instrument rating lessons doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to dig into the books or to reach out and figure out how some of these systems work. And uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for uh, expansion of knowledge. And, I th and not only an opportunity, I think it's a responsibility that we uh, we embrace some of that technology. Yeah. And and as you said, it's not just airplanes that no. have changed, right? 30, 40 years ago, that responsibility would have been accepted more normal because any piece of machinery, a, a car, a farm equipment, right. whatever it is, you would have to have in my, had that kind of understanding. And, and today, for the most part, you don't, right? right? Except in our airplanes. In my 69 Chevy pickup, I could open up the hood and look at the spark plugs. You know, today you open up the hood, you can't even see the spark plugs. Mm -hmm. And and so, yes, it's absolutely a different world. But 
the airplanes we're flying are still 69 and 70s and early 80s vintage airplanes. Yes. And you can open up the hood and see the spark plugs. Yeah. And it is possible to know much more about our airplanes than, than most people do. I'll give an example. I saw a post on a social media site one time where the guy said his CHT was 1500 and he was concerned that his air engine was melting. Well, if in fact the CHT was 1500, his engine would be melting. Mm -hmm. And so that ability to separate, you know, data, good versus bad, is important. Because, and I have another saying that I use often, is that we tend to believe digital information, the accuracy of digital information based on the precision with which it's presented. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we're presenting data to the third decimal point, uh, a perfect, another perfect example is uh, XM versus uh, ADSB weather. You know, people say, I like, I love, don't get me wrong, I love XM weather. Um, and they say they love it because the resolution, the granularity is finer. But the reality is the granularity doesn't matter how fine it is because it's historical information. Okay. And so if we've got this very fine picture of this thunderstorm on XM that's 15 minutes old, it doesn't matter. We just need to know roughly where the weather's at, and then we need to use other strategies, whether it's our storm scope, our eyeballs, or, uh, or ATC, to uh, affirm or to uh, confirm that data. And, and I think we as pilots need to recognize that vulnerability that we have based on the culture. Yeah. Another example along those lines is, uh, you know, I, I see when, when the RPM red line is 2700 and then the color switches to red when it's 2710, right? An analog needle, you wouldn't even be able to, to see a difference. Exactly. But uh, sometimes people get worried about yes. the, the red color when it's at 2710, right. and when if, really it's no difference. And if you adjust the RPMs back to where it will never go above 2700, you're going to probably have a stable RPM of 2650 or mm -hmm. even less. And you're sacrificing that last little bit of power. Yes. In a multi-engine airplane, that might make the difference between climbing and not climbing. Mm -hmm. And further, if you're reducing the RPMs and still using full manifold pressure, you're putting more stress on your engine. So yes, understanding these concepts and, uh, and being able to uh, separate the wheat from the chaff is what a farmer would call it is really critical and that requires a higher level of knowledge, systems knowledge, than uh, people are accustomed to today. You know, the joke was 25 years ago in, air in airline training, you had to learn how many rivets held the wing on. Well, that's going too far. But in a, if we're flying legacy airplanes, we need to dig deeper and, and that's, you got to do that on your own because you're not going to find that at the local flight school. It's not there. So let's talk about how you can get that knowledge. One thing that comes to mind is, you know, the POH contain, contains a systems description. Right. That would be a good start. Uh, be, beyond that, what would you suggest somebody well, should look at? If you own an airplane, you should have the maintenance manual. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the maintenance manual has a lot of this information. Right. It, it goes deeper into it. You know, today with uh, online, there's all kinds of online resources that can take you deeper into, uh, you know, whether they're YouTube videos or just Wikipedia pages. Um, you know, one of the standard uh, oral questions on a type rating for me is if the volts are high and the amps are high, what is wrong and what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And you and I did a video about electricity. I remember that. Yeah. And, you know, volts is pressure and amps is flow. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about that in terms like we described in that, if you think about that and understanding that electricity works like a hydraulic system, you'll understand, oh, this is a pressure regulating problem. That mm -hmm. must be the voltage regulator. Yeah. And it's an easy fix. You turn off the alternator or the generator. And if you need some more power, turn it back on for a little bit. But a better idea would just be the land mm -hmm. while you still have battery energy. That's one example of a way that you can learn more about your electrical system is just by watching a 15 minute video that you and I did. And maybe we should do some more videos that dig deeper into the individual systems of our airplanes.
and uh, there are many, many other videos out there that are right. excellent. I've, I've seen one, and I'll put the link in the description about the Bonanza landing yeah, and Baron. I was just thinking about uh, where that. Where they did exact, a 3D animation well, it was of the whole thing. Some university that did that, yes, and it was excellent. You know, and if you're flying a Beechcraft airplane, you should have watched that video not only once, but and it just reminded me I need to go watch it again. Yeah. But it was the first time I fully understood how the uh, landing gear on my Baron really works. Mm -hmm. And I've owned Beechcraft airplanes for 15 years. And I pride myself on understanding systems, but I really didn't understand it at that level. Yeah. And you know, hopefully that level of understanding is, is never needed, but if something ever goes wrong, it may make the difference between a, a good outcome and a not so good outcome. And, and, and understanding the hardware allows you to make a rational decision. And if you realize, hey, I've got a problem, but it's not a big problem, it's a little problem, that's gonna keep the adrenaline level low, the tension level low, mm -hmm. and is, that's gonna have a greater likelihood of, uh, of ending up in a, in a good outcome. You know, a, a friend of mine was flying a, uh, a, a 185 on floats, and uh, he fueled up for a hour and a half flight or something, not a long flight home, and he had all kinds of gas. And he took off and was flying home, and he noticed that all of his fuel was coming out of the right tank. Mm -hmm. And the left tank was staying, you know, it has a both position, and the left tank was staying full. And he thought, huh, that's interesting. Now, I'm not claiming I would have figured this out either, and he didn't, but that's, that's, that's interesting. I wonder what that's about. You know, maybe my fuel vent, you know, the, the air impact on the fuel vent's higher on one side or whatever. But he just, it was kind of nagging at him a little bit, but he can, continued, and he was on floats, and he was about two miles short of his home lake when the engine quit. And fortunately, there was a little swamp there. He put it in a swamp, flipped the airplane over. It's upside down on its top, and the, the vertical stabilizer went three feet in the mud and didn't even break the lens on the, on the beacon. The only damage to the airplane was the uh, cat whisker antenna on the vertical stabilizer was bent off. Mm -hmm. But... What had happened was he lost a fuel cap and on the left side, and it sucked the fuel out of the left side, okay? The fuel cross-fed, but as it was sucking the fuel out, the fuel bladder came out of its clips and the fuel bladder sucked uh, up off the bottom, held the fuel gauge against full. Yes. So he showed he had a full tank of gas, and uh, in fact, the gas had gone overboard. And, you know, I always tell people, when do you believe your fuel gauge is when they say you have less fuel than you think you do. <laughs> well, here's an example of another time when you shouldn't believe your fuel gauge. If it says it's full and it shouldn't be, that should start us to thinking, now, how could this happen? And understanding the systems of our airplane at a higher level would be a way that we could do that. Yeah. And there are countless examples like that, you know, uh, turbocharged airplanes, if you have an unexplained loss of manifold pressure, right, there could be several explanations, in, including uh, an exhaust leak where you have a blowtorch right. under the cowling. And then there are plenty of resources out there. Uh, all it takes is some curiosity well, and, and time to go out there and learn about it. As I said at the outset, we as pilots have a responsibility to be on a journey of continuous quality improvement and an insatiable quest for knowledge. And uh, there's an Air Force publication that was printed in the 50s. It's called Aircraft Engineering for Pilots. And I, it's, it's my Bible. It explains how the world, you know, the airplanes I fly. But many of those systems are still in place today in our legacy airplanes. And you can dig deeper and understand better how they work. And, uh, and again, I just encourage all pilots to uh, uh, reach out and try to find those resources and learn more about their yeah. particular airplanes. Because, as, as I said previously, some of the posts that I see on aviation social media really make me nervous about pilots' basic lack of understanding of this machine that they load their family and friends and take off into the weather and fly. Mm -hmm. A home builder would be a great example of somebody who, who has mastery, mastery level, level understanding, yes. must have, because must otherwise have. you yeah. can't build it, right? Uh, Maybe uh, an owner-assisted annual might be a way to the learn greatest more about thing, your... you know, If your mechanic won't allow you to participate in the annual, you might want to consider 
you know, a different pa uh, mechanic because it's in your best interest to look under the hood and understand how the hardware works. Right. So go out there, be curious, learn about the airplane because, you know, as, as Doug said, these airplanes are, uh, that we fly today, they, they are not the, the modern, you know, self-healing and self-diagnosing machines that we find everywhere else around us. They are older designs and, and they require an approach to understanding and, and learning that is uh, a generation or two old. But uh, there's a lot of fun in gathering that knowledge and, and gaining that understanding as well. Start digging. And Doug, as always, thanks for your time. Thanks for being here, Martin. All right, take care and see you in the next video.